The whole model for how humans got out of caves is built on sharing of knowledge. To move ourselves forward as a human race relies on us sharing information and being able to point back to truths. Where did this come from? What's the background on this? And being able to lean on things. And generative AI, for the most part, doesn't care about that. I'm Jane McConnell, and welcome to Imaginize World, where we talk with forward thinkers, pioneering organizations, and writers of speculative fiction. We explore emerging trends, technologies, world-changing ideas, and above all, share our journeys, challenges, and successes. Today I'm talking with Thomas van der Waal. I've known Thomas for about 10 years or so. We're both part of an online discussion group in Slack that has existed for around 10 years. And we actually met face-to-face in a conference in Washington, D.C. at KM World. Thomas has had a wide-ranging career with a lot of deep dives into different aspects of technology. What's interesting is he's always focusing on people, what tech means, how it helps us, or as he likes to say, how it's got our backs. You can discover a lot more from his website and his Wikipedia page. Today, we're going to talk about sustainability and the role of technology, which can be positive and can be negative. We're going to cover some different points, starting with AI, especially generative AI or performative AI, mimicking human behavior rather than pure analysis of data. We talk about trust. It's powerful. It's ambiguous. And Thomas has done some very interesting work with students about what that word means to them and how it can be a very confusing word if you don't think about it clearly. We talk about how we can distinguish between human content and AI content. Is it a legal question, an ethical question, simply a question of honesty? Another topic that's very interesting is the famous 15-minute city and Thomas's vision of how it fits in with the global world that we live in today two different complementary parts that fit together. We talk about education and how AI can enhance learning in the near future. And speaking of the future, I asked Thomas what his vision is of the future in the next 10, 15 years. And for him, he says that a major key is technology, which we need to create greater sustainability, but it depends so much on how we use it and how it develops. We cover a lot of things, so let's go. Well, Thomas, it's great to see you here. You and I have been communicating online for, I think it's been about 10 years. Really good to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Our Slack group is very active, and um, I have learned over the years to really appreciate your, you're one of the people who has a very deep understanding of technology, but the thing is you don't approach it as tech, IT. Whenever you talk about technology, you're always into what it means for people, what it means for the way we work, the way we live, and um, you sort of bridge technology and people. And what I'm hoping to do in our conversation today is bridge a different bridge. I'd like to bridge from where we are today and where we could be 10, 15 years from now, because I have a feeling you have quite quite some views on the future too. Okay, is that a, uh, is that true? <laughs> a little bit. Um, part of it comes from looking at today and looking back. Um, so I've been in and around tech world, tried to escape uh, tech world by going into grad school in public policy, um, and came out had one one or two uh, public policy related jobs, um, and then it was fully back into doing essentially tech work, trying to have a deeper understanding of technology and its impact um, as an enabler for people to do work, uh, communicate, and to essentially have something behind them, something that has their back um, as they're doing what they need in their own life. I, I like what you just said, something that has their back as they're doing what they need to do. What do you mean by that? So essentially technology being able to do a fact check, do a spell check uh, as a very basic um, Ah. uh, sort of support system. Um, Being able to have digital calendars that um, are quite accurate um, and 
unless things fall out of the calendar. Um, but being able to have something, you know, a calendar that is on your desktop, it's in your pocket, uh, wherever you're going. Um, essentially it's, it's a tool, a tool and an enabler for what we do in our lives. Mm. Um, and have always looked at technology as being that enabler as being, uh, that assistant for us and whether we have, uh, other people with, with those roles in our lives. Um, technology is a way to, uh, collaborate and work together, you know, whatever, how simple or small something is or, or, or grandiose and incredibly complex things are, but technology, um, is something that can, and I view as should be able to, uh, help us along the way. Right. I like your phrase, have our back. I think that's really, that's really, uh, accurate and it's very, uh, visual and very human. Uh, speaking of humanness, I'd like to talk a little bit about sustainability. It's yes. a, it's a word that uh, we use all the time and I'd like to know how you would define it and, uh, how it, how technology could have our backs <laughs> when it comes to sust- or or not when it comes to sustainability so sustainability from my perspective is being able to have understanding the limited resources that we have here on earth um being able to understand we don't necessarily have a history of using renewable resources things that are not uh of abundance things are limited um and switching from things that are not renewable resources uh, to renewable resources or things that are in more abundance um, and not of limited quantity, um, but still give us the same uh, quality or uh, close to what we've been doing with uh, limited resources, which are also um, sort of damaging our, our global home. Um, so being able to have essentially looking at technology where we will be in the future needs to be able to be friendly or kind to um, that sustainability. So um, computational uh, processing and excessive uh, computational expense. Uh, So things like Bitcoin was just eating power like crazy um, and energy like crazy. Um, And it was not a good thing for the world around us. Uh, as we look at generative AI, it is doing something very close to that as far as uh, computational power that is required to uh, to churn out things with hallucinations. So what is the value of what we are getting out? Um, how can we have things that technologies that will have our back? Um, the traditional AI ML models um, they can be somewhat computationally expensive as well, but being able to see things that humans cannot see um, and being able to have predictive models and understanding, oh, we've got a problem with this. So being able to understand as climate is changing, wind models, uh, other things that we are depending on as renewable resources, seeing those shifts before they are humanly detectable. Thomas, just I want to cut you just for a second because you talked about L models. I think maybe you could explain that for some listeners who might not know what that is. Uh, so the large language models. Yes. So essentially um, having very large models of discrete data down to very small points. And it's actually, essentially the generative AI is using the LLM um, to have small points as predictive models for what would come next as an output. And so it's the generative is essentially a performative AI uh, where it is trying to sound human, sound like it is something that is natural that is coming out. Um, Prior AI ML models, um, machine learning models essentially are going in looking at those relationships essentially as a sensory uh, component and being able to say with this data that we are looking at, here are endpoints. Here's a problem that is happening or a shift that is happening. What are the things that are highly probable to cause those? And so being able to look at wind shifts, um, being able to look at uh, things like beach erosion, all sorts of other things, what will things look like? And being able to do predictive modeling based on much improved 
a systematic historical background and data models or data that is out there so that we're we're able to uh, move forward. Are you hearing jackhammer? I just heard something. Have you got some work going on at your place? Oh, it's not my place. It's behind behind me with oh, very yeah. large jackhammers. <laughs> So what, you, what you're describing there, Thomas, is the way uh, analysis of data is used to right. predict things for us. Right. That's, that's not generative AI, is it? Uh, no, it's the... Um, the earlier version of AI? And so it's, there's a bunch of different models and perspectives um, of what AI does. Uh, the generative AI is more of a lighter weight, essentially performative uh model performative you what, explain what you mean by performative i like that so it's essentially if you think of what is in front of the curtain um on a stage um so it's it's the act and the performance that's happening in front of um in front of the curtain so it looks like it's human it looks like it's or relatively human or relatively of a human creation and mimicking um a performance uh, that's something that would come from a human rather than a lot of the AI ML that we've had before is all behind uh, behind the scenes, uh, doing deep work, um, being able to discern models, patterns, shifts, changes. We are expecting AI, um, generative AI to sort of talk like we talk. I mean, that's what people do when they go online with chat GPT and they ask questions. I've done that. I mean, it's sort of, it's a fun game. Uh, and uh, that's what I mean. I see what you mean by performative. That's a that's a great concept. And so, like ChatGPT has uh, one of its traits is that it comes off and it tries to be um, like official and and correct um, and very confident in what it's putting forward. Um, a lot of the different uh, generative AI models and and applications they. They have very different conversational models around them. Um, and some of them are doing sort of, it's pretty much straight out of like a confidence game um, <laughs> that a con man would do, or uh, like an attorney or uh, a doctor or a nurse and someone in healthcare where you're trying to build confidence between somebody. And it, it's really entertaining to play with them. Pi.ai is one of them. And it will get you to answer questions. You will ask it a question. And it's like, tell me about this. And you know that it's wrong. Um, and it's like, no, that's not quite correct. Um, or it doesn't seem right. And it will say, oh, do you have experience with this? And you say, yes. And it's like, oh, tell me about it. So it's getting you in a conversation. And after about 15 minutes, you're like, what did it just do? And I'm like, the model is really good. And it's very much like being in a doctor's office or being sitting next to a con man on the train. Um, it's very much that, oh, that's a really great idea. Can you tell me more about this? And your guard starts going down. It's like, oh, I have the same understanding, the same, same opinion. And it's that, it's that model that works really well for getting people to interact and think that it is doing well. Whereas sort of the, the chat GPT is, uh, very authoritative, very confident. Um, even when it's has no idea what it's talking about, but it doesn't have any idea of what it's talking about because there is no you know, human existence there. There yeah. is no understanding of right, wrong, correct, incorrect. It is just being performative, sounding like it's human. And um, I gather it uses a lot of material that's collected on yep. people's websites. I forget in the group that we're in in Slack, there was someone who talked about uh, ways you could find out if your website had been... Uh, yeah, it, it's been scraped or... And to my yeah. astonishment, my website, which is not huge... Uh, had been scraped, and not yeah. as much as another guy in our group. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure yours, you, you have a lot of different stuff online. It's probably, you've been scraped probably. <laughs> so what's the, on one hand, what difference does it make? And on the other hand, is it hurting the people who create original content? Coming from a background <laughs> where there's sort of academic proof of where where ideas come from and being able to point to things. Um, and being able to say, oh, I got this idea. And it's also just a really good human trait to be able to say, oh, I read this from, you know, Jane. 
Jane says this, you know, go read Jane's piece. Here's my take on what Jane is saying and not being able to have that human link back and giving credit. And it's like the, the whole model for how humans got out of caves is built on sharing and sharing of knowledge, how we share knowledge, how we share good information um, to move ourselves forward as a human race and improving the human condition broadly is relies on us sharing information and being able to point back to truths. Where did this come from? What's the background on this? Um, and being able to lean on things and generative AI for the most part, doesn't care about that. It is just spitting things out that I think is one damaging piece. And you don't know if something, um, is, you know, has any fact behind it and generative you know, the AI models, the LLMs are going out and scraping things that it has spit out and other LLMs have spit out um, that may or may not be correct. And so it's essentially bad information feeding on bad information, which is really problematic. And from a creator standpoint, you know, there's financial considerations for being able to have your IP that you're sharing. You may have been paid for it. You may have been sharing it freely. Um, but quite often there is something financial for that, either building a network uh, for business or for being able to uh, help others and uh, whatever you're doing financially to support you know, yourself, your family, and so forth. A lot of that is based on what you share, how you share, um, and being able to get uh, some feedback for it and pointers back from it. It's just sort of, there are known folks in various communities who will pick up other people's information and share it as their own in conferences. And sometimes yeah. it is straight copies of slides and other things and passing it off as their own. Um, it is highly frowned upon. And part of it is financial, part of it is also reputation and respect. Um, and generative AI models have none of that um, so far. How is that gonna develop so over the next 10 years? I think part of it is being able to have, being able to push back and have a proof of where things came from. Um, the New York Times is suing OpenAI uh, because OpenAI had scraped uh, the New York Times and its collection and what it has, and they didn't pay for it. Um, they didn't respect the licenses around it, and so that you know that helps. And then also you know essentially having sort of regulation around you know stating that something is created by an AI um, or created by a human. Um, or yes. was edited by an AI. I know an awful lot of people who in their blogs um, and their work that they share out, it, they have a clear disclaimer, this is all human created content. Uh, this is mine. Um, and so not having that, I think, becomes a differentiator. Um, and it comes down to, you know, there's sort of security and privacy um, constraints around it and also being able to sort through what is truth, what is not truth. Um, you know, what are sort of made up facts and, and other things. Um, and coming out of, you know, coming out of a background where, you know, you do academic work or even professional work. And it's like, well, where did you get this? What is your, is this a hunch that you have, or is this something that is actually proven and you have something to back it up? And so it's being able to prove your work prove where you got something. I have strong, strong feelings toward being able to have that um, and being able to know where something came from. I wonder if it's going to come down to legal questions. A lot of the, the legal and regulation that has been talked about within the sort of the generative AI community um, has largely, they, the companies that are out there now sort of have a, a lead more or less and essentially the regulations that they are talking about are protecting their lead uh, rather than protecting the sources and protecting humanity. Um, and what how do you mean? How, how can it protect their lead? Um, so essentially not allowing other people to copy their uh, large language models, um, being able to, if you're using, um, quite often there will be LLMs that essentially are a mix of various things. They'll put questions out to a few different places, bring things back, and then they sort of work and massage through them. Part of it is also for fact checking, um, being able to do a 
a query out to five or six different LLM models, bring it back, being able to do fact check. You know, can I do a, a search on this to be able to find this phrase, being able to find uh, this resource? Does it exist? Um, and being able to do that sort of thing. And that is one of the things, being able to use other other models in a mix is one of the things that is sort of frowned upon by those who were early uh, into the field. Right. And so it's just, you know, we're needing to improve what is out there. What is out there does not come close to meeting the hype that um, is generated around it. So we need to have ways of uh, giving value to people uh, to content that is created by people where it's indicated that it's created by people or there needs to be maybe a, a law. I can't imagine it happening in many countries, a law that says it has to be clear if it's a person or if it's AI, yep. I don't know if that could happen or not, but uh, I think yeah. something has to happen. Something has to change. Likely it's going to be from the bottom up um, and people essentially claiming this is all human created content uh, or, you know, some people use generative AI as essentially their rubber duck um, that they talk to and ask questions to and work through ideas that they have. Um, and just having any, you know, it's essentially a smart rubber duck where you know, it's like you're talking to it, working through ideas, talking to it and realizing as you're talking, something isn't correct, but being able to get some feedback from a thing um, helps them along in their process. And so it's, you know, I don't know where that fully fits in a all human created disclaimer. Um, but it's, you know, if it's somebody in coming up with their own thoughts, their own assemblage of ideas, um, that becomes really helpful. And a lot of our discoveries as humans and things that have moved things forward greatly have all been from a human looking at things and sort of the adjacent possible or a realization as you're looking at a handful of different things rather than repeating things that are out there. Um, and so having a, an AI or a system that is repeating things that are out there and taking what is out there and bringing it back, I don't, don't know that all of that is helpful. Looking at uh, students who are using it and also you know, talking to an awful lot of people that do uh, sort of personal knowledge management and heavy note taking. And they're like, oh, have a generative, you know, have a generative AI go out and read this article for me, give me a summary. And, you know, have 1,200 words turned into 300 words and they put that in their notes. They didn't learn anything from it. The ability to go through and, you know, when you're reading through something and essentially, have, essentially having an argument with it in a, you know, do I agree with this? Do I not agree with what this article is saying? Um, is a really important part of understanding and building your own knowledge base in your in your head. Um, having a tool go and summarize information um, and something that might be highly important for you that is not summarized um, is a you know one of the things that gets lost if you're having something automatically summarized. What do you think? And this is a question I was going to ask you later, but now seems like the right time. Education, the educational system today, it's one of the things I studied. You know, I did a survey of 15 things where I asked people around the world what they thought. Education was one of them. The question was, do the models we have today, are they going to remain the same? Are they going to change a little bit or are they going to change radically? And what you just said about uh, students using uh, generative AI to maybe not write a final paper or maybe also do that or even do research yeah. for them, it seems to me we're touching on what should or shouldn't be done in education. What, right. what, what do you think? I will take the, that narrow <laughs> slice. Um, on, on education, I go down a lot of different rabbit holes, but on being able to use sort of generative AI for education, there are paths where it sort of makes sense, where if you're going through something, um, Education and learning essentially is an accretive model where you have some foundation. If you're missing a foundation, um, so if you're trying to do multiplication and you don't have addition, it becomes really difficult to understand multiplication, which is why you learn addition first. So if you're in a subject 
and it's not particularly your domain, being able to have a generative AI and being able to ask it questions like, you know, what is addition? Um, how does addition work? Um, as you're trying to understand multiplication, being able to get that background, lead you to resources for learning um, and understanding and being able to uh, ask questions like, is there a good YouTube video uh, that summarizes this? And so you get a, a decent foundation of understanding from that video, you know, whether it's like a, uh, the Harvard CS50 set of videos, which are phenomenal. Um, they're just a, a magical tool for learning computer science. I'm not familiar with that. The Harvard CS, it's a computer science. Last name is Mallon. I think it's Jason Mallon, but he's a professor at Harvard. He was undergrad there as well. Um, but he's got this very, it's a very performative lecture on understanding computer science and being able to understand you know, binary counting, all these different things. It is very visual. It is very, oh, this is, this just made it so much easier to understand things. Um, and to the point where somebody in like a freshman in high school could watch it and actually get a solid understanding of computer science um, and have looked at some of the background homework for CS50 class. Um, and it is brutal. <laughs> um the class makes it easily understandable and it is essentially the, the homework pieces are for people with a background in the rigor um, of a Harvard system um, to go through and essentially teach yourself and to work through things. But the, right. the classes and the lectures are just magical at breaking things down. They've come up with really good methods for um, participatory um, interactions um, and essentially being able to stumble on those being, you know, asking Google for good resources for understanding, you know, easily understanding binary counting that it may or may not have you end up at, um, Harvard CS 50, uh, videos, um, which are all free. Um, and you can go through the whole thing. You think they've been um, scraped by AI? I don't know. I don't know that AI would do, I think it would detract from the high value that the videos give mm -hmm. because part right. of it is that full, it, it is a truly performative uh, lecture series. I see. Right. Um, it's, not just, a, it's not just information on paper that can be right. And it's not somebody up there, um, a talking head walking through things, but he will bring students up and it's just like turning on light bulbs with different, um, with the different slots for binary to do binary counting. This is one, this is, you know, this light is off. This is two. This is, and it's like, ah, oh, this actually makes sense. And it clicks. Um, and so it's being able to sort of generative AI or certain generative AI tools will pick up that, hey, there's enough, a lot of people talking about this mm -hmm. um, and being able to do sort of switching search in that manner and being able to find things and point to things. So that's very useful. That's, that saves time if AI is pointing students to things that they might otherwise not come across. Yeah. And being able, to, being able to use sort of a generative AI tool for learning to understand sort of foundational issues that you may have a gap. And you know, if you're taking you know, your third semester of computer science or environmental theory um, and you have a concept that... It, you just have completely skipped or you got a D on that test. Mm -hmm. um, you need to understand what that is. And it's like, Hey, can you give me a good overview of what this is? Can you give me more information? Can you give me pointers to good resources? Students should learn how to use these tools. Then that should be part of education. How, how early, how early should that start? Do you think? I mean, you're sort of talking high school, college, maybe I think, but can you do this with grade school kids? Maybe. So the, one of the other things with, there's sort of a tension that I see between technology and humans interacting with humans um, and being able to bring together those who are near in thought, which technology is great for. Um, it's like I had met you at uh, KM World, I think the first one in DC. 
Um, that was a long time ago, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, and that was my second KM world. Um, and then, but we got to know each other essentially through, you know, digital environments that were yes. bringing people who were near and thought together. Yes. Um, were geographically very far apart, um, as well as many of the other people in the group. Um, and so it's technology is really good for that, but also bringing back the, with education, understanding how to interact with other human beings to get work done, to share, um, how to work through difficult problems <coughs> and, and problem sets as sort of working together in a group, I think is highly important. So having something where you're subbing out a human interaction and learning how to be social as a human to human experience and subbing in a human to technology, I, I really think that needs to come later after we learn how to do the human to human part. You know, that's really interesting. That reminds me of, I talked to Sugata Mitra uh, in a, a, one of my conversations for the podcast, the guy who put the computer in a hole in a wall and the little Indian kids came up and they learned how to use a computer with no adult supervision at all. And in the end, he sort of developed a school in the cloud where the idea is that students don't need teachers other than to guide them and to help yep. them figure out interesting questions. Yep. And that's a little bit what you're talking about. He's talking about young kids, yep. you know, eight, nine, ten yep. years old. Figure it out themselves. Yep. With a computer at hand connected to the internet. There's sort of a balance, you know, watching what is happening in the world right now, having having that understanding of human to human interaction and how to get along and how to work together is highly important. And seeing things that are happening, I think large parts of the populations have lost that. Um, it is seeing, seeing things in a myopic perspective and things can only be in a myopic perspective. Um, so my view is essentially the one that is right. Everything needs to adapt to my view or it's wrong. And as a, you know, as humans, we didn't evolve to where we are now by that model. We evolved by collaborating, communicating, working together um, to be able to solve things and being able to essentially improve the things around us as well as our, our lives and being able to sort of move from a, a, a subsistence model to a more, um, for your model where we're able to actually think thoughts like these and have not, not be chasing down our next meal. Um, and so it's, we have that affordance because we understand how to work together and to communicate and collaborate. There's trust. I think trust comes into right. play. Right. It, I have a difficult time with the word trust, not because of trust itself, but because the word has many different meanings um, and in an awful lot of my consulting work that I did, people would lean on trust because it is a very powerful word. Um, so around 2008, 2009, I started banning the word trust and you had to wor use other words. Oh, that's interesting. Um, what words did people and, use? Um, part, one of them was comfort. Um, I find, uh, there's comfort that I have confidence in what they're saying. Um, there, uh, there's about 10 to 12 different terms that people were using regularly. Um, and essentially in, in working with online environments and social computing and social technologies, I started using social comfort as one of the questions. Are you comfortable using this tool? Um, what are the things that make you uncomfortable? And I could get really good responses. I, if I asked somebody, do you trust the system? Do you trust other people in the system? They couldn't really give a good answer, but they could surely tell you that they had comfort or not. Oh. They did not have comfort and what the, where they found comfort and why, and where they did not have comfort and why. Hmm. Um, and so I found it a, a much better term. And whenever I come up with, come into trust now, um, I still even back off of it. And I, I don't know if they're behind me. Yeah, I've got like three or four books on trust. Oh yeah. Um, the Furukami book. I'm just like, or uh, just like tried to understand what trust was because it just really wasn't clear. And it's not clear because it means so many different things because it, it has turned into a very powerful word 
but it doesn't have clarity behind it. Um, it's interesting. It is a powerful word. I've heard about zero trust. Yeah. In fact, I think you talked about yeah, that, that in the conversation we had online. Uh, that term I'd heard yeah. about, but uh, uh, it wasn't completely clear to me what zero trust was. Essentially from, so zero trust from a, um, is from a security standpoint. And I think over time, not only does technology and where we are heading need to understand sustainability and be very friendly to sustainability and think of what, what paths are we taking? Um, do we need a faster computer? Um, but if it comes at the cost of uh, sustainability, then that's a problem. Mm -hmm. um, but if we're able to go with a, have faster computing and far more efficient computing, um, well, that's a good win. Um, from a security standpoint, security is one of the things uh, that is increasingly, um, you know, as we become more connected digitally, security becomes more and more of a, uh, a value that people are realizing that they need to embrace. Um, so the zero trust model is essentially trusting nothing that you connect to. Um, and being able to, every time you log in or you connect to a system, um, you have to, you authenticate to it and it authenticates back to you. And so you know what, what each other is, you know, it's not only password, you know, username, password, uh, could be a pass key as well. could be two factor authentication, but it's like, you're, you're continually having to prove, yes, I am who I am. There's not anybody in the middle. Um, and part of that is also just being able to protect privacy as well. Um, and getting to privacy models that are not in the people who are trading on our privacy and our data that is uh, private data and privacy related data, but essentially flipping that model, going back to the uh, sort of doc zeros model rather than, um, you know, going to a, a vendor, uh, a vendor based model where the people essentially say, yes, this vendor has the rights to use my data for their purposes, not share it around. And rather than a CRM model, you've got a, a VRM model. So you've got vendor relationship management rather than customer relationship management. Ah, yes. Where, where the people who are selling you something, they don't have control of your data and the data is one of the things that they can sell. Um, but essentially the individual has more control over who has what pieces of information. Um, and it's been interesting sort of watching Apple, which now has in its systems, when you connect to an application for the first time, or do you give it uh, access to all of your data that runs through it um, and that is on your device based on different categories, or do you want to limit it? Um, and sometimes if you limit it, that application will not work. You just have a, a dummy app. Um, and so it's just figuring out what you put in um, it's a it's a compromise. You it, have to make your personal compromise, yeah. don't you? Yeah, or you create or you manufacture information about yourself. Um, Put in false information, like, but then you have to write it down and remember that that's the information right. you gave to that in that place. Yeah, yeah. I have the uh, the one that has always driven me crazy are security questions. Um, you know, what was your dog's name? What are this? And I'm like most of that information is searchable on the internet, what it's asking. So it's not really a security question. So the only way around it is to manufacture that information. And then essentially you are managing two to three different variables for each and every uh, system that you're talking to. It's like, you know, what was your first pet's name? And it's like, okay, for this system, it is this <laughs> name. For this other system, it is another name. And yeah. your password management uh, methods need to be able to embrace all those different, what did I tell this system? Um, and had done that for years and it just got to be absolutely crazy. I'm like, I couldn't, you know, not only do I not remember passwords, I don't remember what I told what system and which, what I told what, even though I have it in my password management, uh, tools. Yeah. And so it's just, you know, because it just, it's putting a burden on us, isn't it, to, yeah. to, to deal with a complex situation? Yeah. And I don't know yeah. how it and could be otherwise. Yeah. And with zero trust, being able to do 
methods that we currently have, being able to have two-factor authentication or uh, the new pass keys that are starting to roll out, that becomes something that is helpful. And just essentially having two different ways of doing it. Um, With facial recognition, you think that's a good solution? Or fingerprint? As one means, then it's it's not necessarily foolproof and there's enough, a lot of people who look like others and there's ways to around things. Mm. Um, but it's, you know, being able to have, you know, information that, you know, and then being able to authenticate with something that you have, um, like your phone, which, you know, if it's your, uh, you know, if you're using facial recognition or fingerprint or whichever, I think, you know, that's helpful. Um, and so it's, you know, we're get, adding a little bit of friction, but sort of the value, um, is just not losing access to our own data and our own, yeah. our own accounts. And I'm getting, you know, 10 to 15, Hey, you, you know, requested to change your password on, on this platform or this platform each week from different yeah. things. And I now have, uh, two-factor authentication, other things on basically everything right now, just because it's, you know, it's like, I didn't put this in. I'm like, if you didn't put it in, let it go. And I'm like, okay, if I, if someone is able to get in the middle and either get to, you know, email or whatever, um, you know, I've lost access to something that I've been on for 15, 20 years and someone either can impersonate me or I don't know whatever value they would find. So sort of going back to the to, di- to the digital world that we live in, do you think it is destroying communities? I'm talking about physical communities where people live. And uh, I'm very interested in the concept of the 15-minute city, which came from a French guy working for the mayor of Paris. And uh, Paris is going very much in that direction. I mean, it's not perfect at all. What, what do you think about that? Or maybe you could explain it quickly for people who don't know it and... Uh, Give us your opinion about it. Um, So 15 minute city is essentially being able to have what you need within a 15 minute walk of your door. Um, So being able to go get produce. So this is fully um, based on a city. Um, If you live rural or if you're out in sort of less dense suburbs, that 15 minute uh, city is not going to necessarily it wouldn't work for replicate. me. I live in such a tiny village. In 15 minutes, it would take me to walk to a place where there might be one store, and that's it. Anyway, that's not that's not what we're talking about. In a in an urban context. So there's an awful lot of layering, but essentially it's being able to walk out your door, being able to you know send a package, being able to pick up groceries, uh, get fresh vegetables, have what you need. Um you know, as essentials and sort of the next level or two above essentials, essentially right outside your, in within a 15 minute walk. Um, And one of the things that it does is it starts building community and you start knowing your neighbors. Um, uh, The application Foursquare uh, looked at data patterns for people living in New York City And essentially they had two different hubs. One is home and one is work. And they didn't go outside of more than a three block radius to four block radius Mm -hmm. of either one of those locations. Um, So going to restaurants, going to, for, you know, going to the dry cleaner or a laundromat or um, grocery. And I'm like, they didn't like 90% of their existence was within a three block radius. But one of the things that you have, there's a number for, uh, planned communities. That's around seven thousand, is one of the magic numbers on scaling. There's a lot of magic magic numbers around all sorts of different layers of um, uh, social progression and social scaling, and one of them is around seven thousand, which is for planned communities. Seven thousand is an elementary school, uh, a high school, fire department, um, medical and, care, a small police station, and medical care. But it is also roughly the 4,000 to 7,000 range is essentially where you feel comfortable because you are seeing familiar faces. You may not know them. You may have never said a word to them. 
Um, but you're seeing faces that you recognize and that gives sort of a human comfort. And so that, that three, three block to four block radius is essentially a 4,000 to 7,000 person density, um, for both locations that they have. And so there is some level of familiarity, um, and people who live in areas that don't have high, high crime rates, but they have more than moderate crime. They feel safe in their neighborhoods or can feel safer in their neighborhoods because they have familiarity with the people around them. Uh-huh. They not only know their neighbors, but they recognize the people a few blocks away. Um, if they're going to the bus or, you know, uh, they're out, they know when, when there is somebody who is unfamiliar. Um, and if you're going to a neighborhood that may have a far lower crime rate, they do not feel comfortable. Um, if you drop them in that, because they do not have any familiarity with any of the faces around them. Right. Um, and so it's like, you're going from a moderate crime rate environment where you feel somewhat comfortable, uh, just because there is familiarity of the people around you to one with low crime rate, but you, you don't feel safe because you don't have familiarity, uh, through that recognition. Um, and so being able to have, being able to have things where, we're not having food delivered. We're not having our delivery services will tell us, Hey, you actually have this within a few blocks. Uh, you're trying to buy a fresh, uh, loaf of bread. You know, here's an option for you. And just being able to bring things back and saying, Hey, this is available or ordering a book from, you know, a large multinational, uh, bookseller and product seller and having it say, Hey, this, this book is actually available from, you know, uh, Susan's book, uh, book nook, you know, three blocks away from you. Uh, do you want us to reserve it for you? Um, and being able to have that sort of connection. So you're actually walking out the door, connecting with your community, building that human bond with other people in your community. I think it's something that would greatly help. There's sort of two human draws. One is being able to have a local community of people who are geographically close to you and having that comfort level with people who are familiar, getting to know them, you know, holding doors for people, uh, going into stores, having them helm, being able to say hi or good morning as you're walking past them. Um, and then the other one is being able to bring people closer through near and thought, um, people who have similar interests. Um, so if you're somebody who is, um, either has an interest or, in a in something that is not available within a 15 minute walk or even within that city um so if you're in you know let's say paris and you are have a a large interest in indonesian food um and there isn't anything close to you being able to connect with people who have an interest in cooking indonesian food um you're likely going to have to go online so being able to bring those near in thought and near in interest bringing that closer um, but then also being able to have that human interaction and being able to understand the value of both of those um, and using technology to enable both of those uh, both of those systems to improve from an entertainment interest perspective of food or um, just a knowledge perspective right. and being able to have knowledge at your fingertip uh, that's globally shared and globally accessible. So um, but you, you see having, sort of a blending of the two worlds. Yeah. And being able to have, you know, if, if large multinational company that ships books all around, um, which I may have um, used more than once, <laughs> um, but being able to have them and recommend something, you know, to Susan's book nook, um, they may get a cut of it or, you know, you know, 5% or 2% for doing that recommendation. They're making money on it. It's bringing connection to your local community. Um, so you're essentially looking at the the technical side of things and the social side of things, bringing them together. Um, so we're coming together as humans, as well as also increasing human knowledge um, and understanding. Do you think that's possible that these uh, big technical giants uh, could uh, be persuaded to do that? I mean, they make more if they sell to you directly, I imagine. Uh, so they would need some kind of incentive to recommend local solutions, even if they get a cut, 
it wouldn't be as yeah. much as if they had made the original sale? Or am I so being too pessimistic? So I think there's a model in there. So having watched Amazon do local bookstores and where I live, we had a, an Amazon bookstore uh, show up. Um, there's some really good independent bookstores that are around. Um, and the, the Amazon bookstore existed for about two or three years and then was gone. Oh. And so they're having to pay they pay for, you know, all the cost of running a physical business locally. Um, but being able to have their name, being able to have a recommendation system, them being in that life cycle of, right. of commerce, that may be beneficial to them. If they're yeah. picking up 2% on a local sale where they are not paying the cost, they're just doing a recommendation. And they could be doing it all over the, all over the world, basically. Yeah. Nearly, you know? Yeah. That, that's interesting. Yeah. I see what you mean. There is a model there. You know, figuring out what that is with the local bookseller, figuring out what it is for the large multinational. Um, but it starts, there is human value in, in being able to do that, whether they have interest in human value and societal value, you know, that becomes a question or if it's just pure profit, um, you know, that's always, that's a question that comes up often in, in many places. Um, and sometimes the line is nowhere near clear. Do you, and this is my final question, because I think we're going to close down. Um, Overall, would you say that you're optimistic about where we'll be 10 years from now? Or say, make it harder, 15 years from now. Are you optimistic that we'll be in a better place from a human viewpoint or not? The big, it depends, is sustainability. Um, And one of the large players in sustainability as a positive or negative is technology and being able to have better, smarter, more efficient models um, that are not eating as many resources and considering resources and sustainability in and off a lot of the decision-making, you know, for building large um, generative AI models or, Somebody thinks it's smart again to go back to Bitcoin and just massive uh, energy just being thrown down a hole. Um, you know that becomes, you know that becomes problematic. And just sort of what are the, what are we getting out of it um, as a society? What is beneficial from their being able to do it? Um, and so a you know the AI ML being able to understand the changes to our environment um, and to what's happening around the globe, we really need to understand that. Uh, Being able to have a performative bot that sits on our our desktop and is eating a ton of energy on the back end to be able to answer, answer questions. I don't know if that's a great benefit and a use of um, our resources. So are you sort of on the fence about how it will go? It sort of I, I know it's a it's a simple question with a it's not a simplistic answer. I mean it's a <laughs> no, complex it's a, a very complex, issues. yeah. Yeah. And it, it's one of those where cuz I've got to talk next month uh to Complexity Lounge um on complexity. And so it's like, oh, there's for the answer to this, tune in. Um <laughs> but um yeah, it, it's a really complex uh, problem technology really needs to sort out where it sits on sustainability um, and those who are you know those who are able to work through one having more secure systems having more uh, systems that respect our privacy being able to have coding and systems that are far more efficient um, and also using uh, renewable resources for that, not necessarily, um, you know, swap credits or, uh, credits on, we planted 700 trees. So therefore we can set up this new server farm, but being, (laughs) you know, truly using renewable resources, um, and not, not doing the trade-offs. I think the faster we can get to that, you know, from a technology side, 
the more that we can do with technology um, and essentially have technology have our back rather than having technology essentially becoming part of the problem rather than part of the solution. Thomas, you need to write a book about that. <laughs> Does technology have our it, backs? I'm serious. I'm not joking. Yeah. It's an approach. It, Maybe there's a book already out there that does that. I don't know. I've never looked it up from be. that viewpoint. I know there's a lot of people yeah. writing about AI and the goods and the bads yeah. and all that, but you're talking about it in a different way. And I think, um, I think you have an idea there that uh, is quite powerful. Yeah. I, yeah. I need to get writing out again outside of back channels. Um, and so it's, I've been, reconnecting with an awful lot of uh, folks over the last few months, uh, mostly being heads down for the last five years working. Yeah. Um, and the common common thing I get is you need to get back writing and sharing things out again. Oh, yeah. You, um, you've done so much, Thomas, in your short life. Well, I'd like to thank you for your, for your time. And uh, if you do write that book, uh, give credit to this podcast to being the place where the idea – was generated to use a common yep. word. I will do that. I will put that in my notes. <laughs> <laughs>